Ladies and gentlemen, on today's episode, we have a mountain of information for you all as we sit down with Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Manager Camden Glade. We chat with Camden about some fascinating research that he was a part of looking closely at the stomach contents and diet overlap of largemouth bass, walleye, pike, and muskie. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello everybody, I'm Bill Dance and you're listening to Tackle Talk. to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast. We have a real treat for you guys today, but before we dive in, we do have to give a huge shout out to the boys over at American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. And today, I'm actually going to let you guys do the talking when it comes to ALF. Eric wrote into us saying, by the way, you talk about Dobbins rods a lot, and I just got a Caden 745C for jig fishing. I had the pleasure of dealing with a young lady named Kayla in the shipping department at ALF. She is awesome. Another one here from Trenton says, Hey Andrew, I just wanted to thank you for letting us know about American Legacy Fishing's trade-in program. I had no clue it was so close to where I live, and I just traded three Mach 2 rods for a new SLX-MGL combo. Thanks again. And another one here from Jason says, Man, ALF took good care of me. I never got that kind of service from a website in my life. I'm going to have to order there more often. So right there, that is why I and so many other people choose American Legacy Fishing, where you can get big site selection with mom and pop shop service, all from some great folks right here in the Midwest in southern Indiana that truly care about their customers. So whether you need new gear or used gear, whether you need one rod or a hundred, whether you you just have questions about gear, ALF is there to help. So head over to www.americanlegacyfishing.com and as always, be sure to use code TACKLETALK10 at checkout to save 10% off almost everything on the website. Some exclusions apply, but not many. Almost everything on that website is 10% off with code TACKLETALK10 over at www.americanlegacyfishing.com. All right, and one last thing here before we start today's episode, our Give Them the Bean shirts are live on the website right now as we speak. The bigger sizes sold out immediately, but we still have mediums, larges, and extra larges available on the website. So if you want to grab our very first shirt that we ever produced, a really nice Heather Gray 6040 blend shirt, super comfortable, clean Give Them the Beans logo on the front with a silhouette of a guy setting the hook, they're available right Right now at www.tackletalkpodcast.com. Just click store at the top of the page or click the banner right there on the homepage and it will take you to the spot where you can order those shirts. Thank you again to everyone that's ordered one so far. Those initial orders on Friday are in the mail as we speak. They should get there any day now. And anyone that orders one from here on out, I will immediately package it and ship it to you that evening when I get home from work. So you will get it quick. I really appreciate you guys, all the support that you've showed this show over the years. And I can't wait to see you guys rocking the shirt. So again, it's TackleTalkPodcast.com. Click store. The Give Them the Bean shirts are live right now. All right, everybody, today is a glorious day because today I get to sit here and tell you that you're about to listen to one of those episodes that everybody seems to love. Of all the types of episodes we do, gear reviews, unbiased talk about tackle, tips and tricks, money-saving advice, even some of the biggest names in fishing like Bill Dance, Jimmy Houston, Jacob Wheeler, Mike Iaconelli, it doesn't matter. The episodes you guys seem to like the most are the true nitty-gritty information-packed science and biology episodes. So that's what we have for you guys today. Today we are joined by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Manager Camden Glade, who is fresh off of multiple research studies that all revolve around the dietary patterns of predatory fish, particularly largemouth bass, walleye, pike, and muskie. 
So today we're going to talk to Camden about a topic that we're all very interested in. What the heck is inside a fish's stomach? Like literally what's inside? That's what they're checking when they're doing this research. What are they eating? When are they eating it? Where is the overlap between species and what can we take away as anglers to help us on the water? So we cover all of that and more in our conversation right now with Camden Glade. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by a very special guest today. We have a fishery specialist from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Camden Glade. Camden, thank you so much for stopping by Tackle Talk today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. So this is going to be a lot of fun. I know I told you when I uh, sent you a message and we were emailing back and forth, this probably doesn't come as a shock to anybody that listens to, you know, the show by now. But, you know, as other people are on their lunch break or after work reading Sports Illustrated or ESPN.com or whatever, I'm perusing through, you know, fisheries management case studies and research from DNRs and stuff like that. And I came across either two or three of the studies that had your name on it. And all of them had a similar theme to them that I thought would be really fun to kind of go over today, which is the diet of predatory fish. And so I dove into all three of those. They were very interesting reads. And uh, I do appreciate you, you know, reaching back out to some random guy that slid into your Instagram messages and asked if you wanted to come on a podcast. So I do appreciate it. (laughs) Hey, no problem. I'm a fish nerd at heart too. So anytime we can talk fish, that's, that's a good day by me. So I guess for starters, on a quick background on you. So obviously, fishery specialist with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. How long have you been doing this? How did you get into it? And when did you decide that, okay, not only do I have this interest in either fishing as a sport or fishing as more of an ecological thing and wanted to kind of parlay this into a career? How long have you been doing this? Yeah, I'm still relatively new in my career. Uh, i only been with the DNR for about a year, a little over a year now. Uh, worked at the college that I did my graduate work at for a little bit over a year before I started here. But I always tell people I've been a fisherman a lot longer than I've been a fishery scientist. So, you know, going back to some of my earliest memories, and actually there's some home videos from before I remember of me fishing with dad and grandpa catching bullheads and sunfish off the dock or off the bank. Um, so, yeah, fishing's been a big part of my life ever since. It took me um, longer than I would have liked to decide that this is what I wanted to do for a job just because it's it's been so much fun since I made that decision. But I actually went to, to college as kind of a pre-med major uh, just because I kind of enjoyed science. I was relatively good at school, so that kind of just made sense for an 18-year-old that didn't really know what they wanted to do yet. Uh, but I got about a year and a half in and had an a uh, professor that had been a biologist with a state management agency prior to being a professor. And he kind of put a bug in my ear that this was something I could do. And actually it was a, an in fisherman article looking at uh, tracking blue catfish movements in like a Kansas reservoir or something that really kind of flipped the switch on the light bulb and said, you know, you, you, you can like fish and there's actually a way to integrate the science into that and make it a career. So, uh, yeah, about my sophomore year of undergrad, I I made that switch and I haven't looked back since. So when you go into something like fisheries management or that type of thing, I personally always think of the state route because I think it's just the most forward facing thing that a lot of us as anglers interact with. You interact with your DNR, your division of wildlife, all those type of things. What other options are there for someone in your field to go that's not necessarily like the, the state route? What do you guys do? Is it more private pond management and stuff like that? Or what are the other options with your field? Yeah, it's, it's definitely heavy towards government agencies. Uh, the state biologists are a big one. Uh, there's also federal biologists with like the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Forest Service. Um, other than that, academia is probably the next one. So like a college professor, um, some research colleges are actually big enough that they have just kind of research scientists on staff. So you can kind of do some of the research stuff without maybe some of the teaching uh, recommendation or requirements. Uh, And then also, yeah, like you said, kind of the private contractors or the consultants that are doing pond management, that kind of thing. Uh, Here in Minnesota, we actually have some private hatcheries that raise varieties of different fish uh, that then can get stocked in either local lakes. Otherwise, I know I've talked to a couple of them that are dealing with uh, people that are purchasing fish kind of all over the country and they're shipping fish, you know, hours and hours away from their their local uh, where they've got their ponds. So. But yeah, for the most part, it's it's pretty heavy towards either state or federal uh, management agencies. 
So talk to me a little bit about you as an angler, because I'm going to be 100% honest. When I read those articles and I was looking up and trying to find you, I found you on Instagram and scrolling through and there's nothing that makes me feel better about doing an episode than not only someone having the, you know, the educational side, but also the angling side, because that's kind of what we always try and tie it back to. Obviously, we're a fishing show and going through your photos. It's very evident that you're an actual angler, that you have this passion for, you know, the sport. And that kind of made me feel good, too. I was like, oh, OK, this is going to be a good conversation because you can wear both hats. You have sometimes where you have, you know, state biologists and people like that that just have the science hat on. They just have the biology hat on and making that bridge or that connection to the recreational angler, the tournament angler, um, that side of things sometimes is a little tougher. So tell me a little bit about you as a as an angler. What's your favorite target species? How long you've been doing it? Um, what kind of waters do you like to fish? Things like that. Yeah, I've like I mentioned, I've been doing it as long as I can remember. Uh, kind of took the the same evolution that a lot of anglers go through. It started with, you know, bullheads and panfish, whatever would bite off the dock on a, a worm under a bobber. Uh, from there, I started doing some bass fishing uh, through a combination of trips up north to Minnesota to a resort on a lake. And then I was actually lucky enough that my great uncle had a farm pond about an hour from where I grew up that was pretty well loaded with some really quality bass too. So I did a lot of bass fishing kind of in my teenage years. And then there were just a couple years on our family vacation up North where I don't know if it was a shift in the population or a shift in what we were doing fishing, but we started into running, started running into these fish with teeth, uh, pike on the lake. And, you know, for somebody that had grown up catching, you know, bullheads and panfish and bass stuff that you just stick your thumb in your mouth and you don't even worry about it to see something come in with teeth that, you know, you kind of had to be careful about that was really intriguing and really cool. So kind of shifted towards doing a lot of pike fishing, at least on that trip, and then still doing a lot of panfish and bass fishing other times of the year. Uh, that kind of carried into college. Uh, there was a river that went through town when I was in college. So there were some walleye there and that was, that was fun to kind of dip my toes into a little bit, uh, as well as some smallmouth. That was something that I hadn't really tangled with prior to that. Uh, and then from there, I actually got a job at a trout hatchery out in Nevada. Um, so I spent a little over a year out in Nevada uh, working at a trout hatchery. And then we had a couple local streams and ponds that were close by that I could just walk to right after work, uh, catching rainbow and tiger trout and a couple browns here and there. And then when I was able to start grad school back in Minnesota, um, you know, that kind of got me full on into Minnesota lakes fishing. Uh, a lot of walleye fishing, still a fair bit of bass fishing, but muskies were really high on my list. I'd, I'd had a chance to tangle with them a couple different times, uh, once during an internship during college where I was up on the uh, Wisconsin and Michigan upper peninsula border. There was a, a lake with muskies there that I kind of got my first taste. And then I'd gone on a couple of musky trips since then, but then kind of up in that Bemidji area known for really big muskies. I, I kind of started dipping my toes into there. So I would say muskies are probably my, both my favorite and least favorite fish to target right yep. now, <laughs> uh, as, as most musky anglers would probably tell you. Um, I don't get enough time to fish recreationally that I'm okay not catching fish every time I go out. So I do still fish for other stuff as well. Uh, predominantly walleye, occasionally bass. And then I really do like uh, chasing bluegills and crappies too at certain times of the year. But uh, muskies are probably top of the list right now. Yeah, it's kind of evident in your research, too, that we'll get to here in a little bit, too. There is a musky focus, which I really love because, again, not to not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it's like there's so many differences between the top three or four target species that we as recreational and, and kind of tournament anglers and stuff go after. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. But, yeah, I, I think you echoed it perfectly, right? Anybody who's ever spent any amount of time targeting musky, they are your favorite and least favorite fish at the same time. You're going to go out there for 10 hours and nine hours and 54 minutes of it are going to be absolutely miserable. And if you're lucky, at least around here, you're lucky. Maybe you raise a fish. Maybe you get, you know, a small follow or something. And that was like worth the day. And then you do have the magical days where you hook up once or twice. But yeah, it uh, it's definitely cool to see that focus up there. You also mentioned so like bass, walleye. Um, around here in Ohio, sawguy is a huge target species of ours. The DNR um, does a pretty good job of stocking and having them in multiple places. Do you guys have anything like that up there that you guys work on where you sort of, I don't know the right term, right, but kind of hybridize, you know, multiple species that are a little bit more specific to your region up there? 
Uh, we do a little bit of tiger muskies in the state, which is a cross between muskies and northern pike. Um, I don't know that we intentionally do any saw guys. We do have some lakes with sauger in them, so there's always that off chance that they would hybridize on their own. But yeah, in terms of intentional hybridization, uh, outside of some of the hybrid trout that we stock in some of our put and take lakes, uh, tiger muskies is really the only one that we deal with. So obviously we're going to talk today, your research revolves around kind of the consumption patterns of predatory fish, I guess if we could wrap it up in a couple words there. So before we actually get into the specific studies themselves, there's two or three we're going to talk about here. Why is the consumption pattern of these predatory fish important? Why does it interest you? And uh, how was this kind of a path that you went down? Was it something that you chose or something that, you know, the DNR was like, hey, we need to find out more about this? Yeah, so in terms of why it's important, um, I, we'll kind of get to this a little bit or in a little bit, but uh, the musky focus of the study was really what drove uh, all three of these topics that we're going to touch on tonight. Uh, there's lots of concern anytime that state management agencies are stocking muskies in lakes and rivers. Uh, just over, you know, it's a big fish with lots of teeth in their mouth. For people that maybe aren't as familiar with them, it's really easy to see how you can look at a fish like that and say, oh, they're eating all of X favorite fish that I like to fish for in the lake. Uh, And we really didn't have any good data in Minnesota to say, no, that's not the case. Um, And then beyond kind of that kind of aspect of it, just knowing how these lake food webs function, um, who's eating who, what are maybe some of the limitations in terms of uh, predator densities that certain lakes can can support uh, in terms of making sure that there's enough prey for everybody to be happy and healthy in terms of predator fish eating food. Why it interests me, uh, this again goes back to my fishing background growing up uh, on those trips. You know, I'm, I grew up in Iowa and we got one week a year to go up north and, and fish. And so we cleaned a vast majority of the fish we caught regardless of species. So we were, we were cleaning pike, we were cleaning walleye, we were cleaning bass that we caught too. And regardless of what we were cleaning, uh, every time we were at the fillet table, we were taking the stomach out and looking to see what they were eating. Just because, you know, as an angler, it's like, okay, this is a really easy way to see what these fish are actually doing in this ecosystem here. And maybe that gives you a leg up. Maybe not. Maybe it just confuses you more than you already were because you already caught that fish. But um, just kind of that general interest in, you know, what these fish are doing under the water when we can't see them. And then what we really know about the consumption patterns of these fish versus conventional wisdom, um, there's been, you know, a fair amount of diet studies on fish kind of all over the country and over the world, really. Uh, The techniques that we used really aren't new by any stretch of the the imagination. Um, But just, you know, kind of getting a really good detailed look at what these fish are doing in these specific lakes and these specific ecosystems. And then, yeah, maybe either confirming the conventional wisdom or the generalizations that people have going into it, or maybe shedding some light on some, some different interactions that are going on in the systems. So um, yeah, that's kind of where my interest for the project came and, and how it came about. I was actually really lucky. I attended a fisheries conference while I was in college um, in Michigan and was listening to some people talk about different research projects that they were doing. And this was, you know, kind of just at the start of when graduate school was starting to get on my radar. And I actually took notes in a notepad that they gave out to everybody as kind of a door prize. And it basically ended up outlining the study that I did during graduate school. Um, I didn't know that people were already talking about it at the time, but, you know, a couple of years after the fact, I emailed a professor at the university that I went to And he basically had that same project already lined up and he was just starting to look for a grad student. So it really kind of just fell into place uh, that I was able to work on my dream project as a grad student. So that was that was really lucky on my part and just a great opportunity. Well, let's start with the first of the three studies we're going to talk about today. Um, If I'm correct, I think this is the one that you headed up yourself, I believe. This is called Diet Patterns and Niche Overlap of Muscalunge and Co-Occurring Piscivores in Minnesota Lakes. So this was from April 2023, I believe, or at least when it was published when I found it. But can you give us like a call it like a 30,000 foot view of what this study was and what it was attempting to find out or what it was attempting to achieve at the end of it. 
the focus of the study was really the muskie aspect. Um, there's been studies, you know, in, in Wisconsin, there's been a study in Pennsylvania, there's been a study down in Illinois looking at what muskies are eating. And it's been generally pretty consistent across the board, regardless of where these studies are taking place. But we hadn't had anything done in Minnesota up until recently. And so we really wanted to get a good detailed look of what Minnesota's muskies are eating in a variety of lakes with different prey bases. But then the other aspect of it was, okay, we, we have a pretty good idea that muskies probably aren't eating all the walleye. There's been enough research looking at muskie diets that walleye just don't show up a lot in muskie diets. We're going to look, and if we see something different, we'll we'll report that as well. But we're pretty sure that's not what we're going to see. But maybe muskie are eating the same food as walleye, and maybe that's introducing competition in these lakes where muskies are stocked. So that's where we get the diet patterns, you know, detailed looks at what these fish are eating, and then the niche overlap, looking to see if they're eating the same food and if that might be cause for concern going forward. Uh, so that's kind of the the big picture look at that study. So what did you find in terms of the overlap and in terms of what we can take away from this? Because the conventional wisdom is you got some 70-year-old dude in his boat that fishes the same lay down every day for crappie. And then when he doesn't catch him, he complains that the muskie are eating all the crappie and every muskie that's caught should be thrown on the bank because they're worthless and they're eating all the, the crappie in the river or the lake. So um, what did you find on this? What was their primary forage? Because as I was reading through, things that stick out to me are like, it seems like muskie are eating things not only that don't overlap a whole lot but that other species almost aren't even touching like suckers are a really good example where maybe something like a muskie i don't know how to word this correctly but is not as big of a an issue to other species as it is maybe just helping clean up the lake with some of the forage that isn't playing a role for your bass your walleye your crappie um you know your saw guy other things like that am i right or wrong on that yeah, it's, I think it goes back to kind of the size of the fish that we're talking about. You know, muskies are just kind of on a whole separate level from the majority of those other three species. Yeah, you get some really big walleye in some lakes up here. Yeah, we've got lakes that can produce really big pike, but even a really big pike is, you know, kind of a, a moderate sized muskie for a lot of Minnesota lakes. Um, so there's just so many more options for those fish in terms of what's even on the menu. Uh, kind of like you mentioned, you know, those walleye and those pike and those bass, they're limited by how big their mouths are and the size of food that they can, you know, swallow whole because they're not chewing their food. Uh, muskies, really anything that swims in the lake is is a potential prey item for them. So that's that's kind of where that comes in. Yeah, you're you're definitely right. Muskies. Uh, they did eat some of the same stuff that the other three species did, uh, but it was just in such lower quantities because they were eating other big stuff that just wasn't available for the other three species. Were there certain things you would find that muskie wouldn't touch or you never found evidence of them eating at all? Or is it just a almost a complete free for all for them? You know, in certain lakes, there were species that we didn't see um, that could be because muskies weren't eating them or it could just be a timing thing or a location thing um, in terms of across the different lakes that we looked at there wasn't really a pattern in terms of stuff that really wasn't on the menu i mean we even saw like bowfin in a couple musky stomachs um burbot or eel pout was another one we saw in musky stomachs so uh just you know kind of ranging the gamut we saw a few birds we saw some muskrats frogs um so yeah just kind of anything and everything that a muskie could get its jaws around was was an option for them all right we'll get back to the episode here in just a second but first the tackle talk podcast is brought to you in part by mossy oak and folks one of my favorite pieces of gear over the past few months has definitely been my mossy oak tech shirts we've had unseasonably warm temperatures lately and these tech shirts are lightweight they're cool they've kept me protected from the sun they're comfortable in the wind and they just make those days on the water so much more enjoyable and right now those exact same long sleeve tech shirts are on sale starting at 17 
99 over on the Mossy Oak website. So most other sites are going to have stuff like this for $30, $40, $50 a shirt. But right now over on the Mossy Oak website, they have a ton of patterns, all of them with that Hydroplex technology starting at $17.99. There's a reason. You're going to see guys like Kevin Van Dam, Brandon Polinick, Greg Hackney, Hank Parker, Ott Defo, all of those guys wearing Mossy Oak fishing apparel out there on the water. When you're out in the elements, make sure it's Mossy Oak. So head over to www.store.mossyoak.com, click fishing at the top of the page and check out their full line of tech shirts, hoodies, t-shirts, shorts, and more. Again, that's www.store.mossyoak.com. So you said earlier, like way back in the day, obviously, when you're harvesting fish, you can cut open the stomach and you can see what's in there. I've seen videos on your social media of how you're actually extracting the stomach contents of these fish. And it is probably the coolest darn thing that I've watched in a long time. I don't know the physics of this. I don't know how it works. Basically, you're like reverse beer bonging this uh, muskie where you're throwing like, you know, a, a pipe or like a piece of tubing in its mouth. And it looks like you're shoving water in there. And then that's sort of I don't know if it's recirculating or whatever, but kind of pushing the stomach contents out. So like I saw a video of you guys pushing that water in and then a giant bird comes out of, you know, this muskie's mouth. How is that working? Is that how you extract most or all of your data? Or is that something more specific to musky because they're big enough that you can do that and you have other ways of extracting stomach contents for bass or walleye or things like that? Yeah, that was the method we used on the vast majority of the fish. Um, We worked in tandem with the Minnesota DNR management teams around the state. So if they were doing like a gill net survey about the same time that we were doing our diet stuff, if they had you know, fish that had died in the gill nets, walleye, pike, and bass predominantly, just because they don't catch very many muskies in the gill nets. We would take those fish and we would cut the stomachs out and look at their diets that way. But anytime we had the opportunity to get really good detailed diet information on these fish and then put them back in the lake so that they could, you know, keep doing their thing down there, that was the route we wanted to do or to go. Uh, And that's especially important for the muskies just because they're stocked in a lot of lakes. The fish are expensive to raise and expensive to stock. They take a long time to get to kind of that trophy size that a lot of anglers are looking for. And they're just really low density fish in a lot of lakes. You know, they're um, kind of orders of magnitude lower in population density than some of the other predators and prey fish in the lakes. So uh, that was a really big priority was to make sure that we were getting this good detailed information, but also being able to put the fish back in the lake. And yeah, your, your description was spot on. Basically we had a hose hooked up to a bilge pump that was powered by a battery that hung over the side of the boat. Uh, That bilge pump was hooked up to kind of just a trigger garden nozzle. So you could control the flow a little bit. And then off of that was uh, a piece of vinyl tubing with a little bit of copper pipe inserted in it to keep the tubing rigid. And you just kind of inserted that into the fish's mouth and back towards the back of the stomach and filled the stomach up with water. And it just created back pressure on anything that that fish had eaten recently and just forced it straight back out the mouth. Um, A lot of times, especially with the muskies, they had eaten things that were so big that they didn't just kind of fly out. Uh, It's not like they were projectile vomiting this stuff. Um, It needed a little encouragement to get some of the bigger stuff out. So we'd use, you know, long hemostats or even like kitchen tongs that we would get from a a hardware store or a grocery store or something to help us reach back in there and, and get out anything that they'd eaten recently. So muskie are also notoriously fragile fish for their size, just in terms of, you know, it's like you f- you don't want to fight a muskie for very long. It, the lactic acid or whatever it is builds up that fish delayed mortality, all that stuff. We, you know, we all know it as anglers. But, you know, are these fish swimming away strong and they're fine? Like that seems like a pretty traumatic thing to go through of just like have your stomach pump, pull a bird out of it and then like, all right, thanks, buddy. See you later. Yeah, it it does look pretty traumatic, and I'm not going to come on here and say that it's a perfect process. You know, there's there's definitely some hiccups throughout the process, but the vast majority of the fish, you put them back in the water, and we're actually using electricity to kind of immobilize the fish while we're doing this process. And as soon as you kind of take your hands off the fish and they're they're no longer stunned by that electricity, a lot of times they're they're taken off just like they would if you had caught the fish on hook and line and you know took a couple pictures and then lean back over the boat with your hand on its tail to let it go. They, they take off, they'll splash you in the face. So it's, it's really impressive. 
Um, and I might touch on this a little bit later too, but we actually have pit tags or um, kind of microchips in a lot of the muskies that we did this process on. So that's something I might look into, uh, you know, years down the road as more and more of these fish get recaptured in surveys uh, just to see what kind of the long-term survival of some of those fish was. So I can't just gloss over the fact that you said that you have electricity somehow hooked up to these fish to stun them. How does that work? You got like two, all right, clear and boom, and put it like, you know, on this fish, you know, positive and negative end and it just stays or how, what's charging it? I have so many questions on how you have electricity uh, being connected to this fish. Yeah. So I don't have nearly as many good videos on this aspect, but electricity was really important for my project for two reasons. So Number one, that's how we captured the vast majority of our fish was boat electrofishing. So basically you've got uh, this electrical system that runs off a generator on the boat and it basically just creates an electrical current off of big chandeliers that hang off the front of the boat to the boat hull. And anything that's kind of, you know, within a couple feet of that that circle around the, the electrical current is immobilized and they actually will float towards the electricity just the way that their muscles are are kind of tensed up by the electricity and that allows us to scoop these fish up with a net and bring them on board into a live well Uh, and that's how we capture the vast majority of the fish that we're dealing with and then once we once we go to remove their diets uh, basically we have this uh, system created by uh, one of the boat electrofishing manufacturers. So they kind of used the same technology and packaged it up into gloves that are hooked up to a little battery pack. It just creates a light electrical current that goes from one hand that has a black wire attached to it to the other hand that has a red wire attached to it. And the electricity just flows through the fish between the two gloves when you're holding them. And it does the same thing. It just basically makes all of their muscles contract at kind of the same time so they're not able to kind of flex back and forth or flop around or anything and it it holds them pretty still while we're doing the work we need to do and then again as soon as you take those fish out of the electrical current or take your hands off the fish they're they're alive and ready to go so it's a really slick process oh my god you are your musky thanos over here you're just like you got these giant gloves on that positive and negative that's so cool obviously i knew about the electro fishing i assume that's probably how you were capturing a lot of them but had no clue that you have this way of like you said sort of immobilizing them it'd be one thing if you know you're doing bass or something but a muskie's also dangerous as you're up there yeah. and you've got something in its mouth that you're trying to extract things out of its mouth like you said the fish or the birds or whatever are not just getting projectiled out you have to reach in there you have to have sutures or whatever to get in there and grab them it's like that's definitely a a dangerous treacherous process i didn't even know this was a tool that you guys had so very very cool um what's the craziest thing that you've pulled out of a muskie's stomach oh out of a muskie's stomach it's got to be well, in terms of kind of eye popping, you know, some of those non fish things that we saw uh, the first time we got the muskrat was everybody in the boat was hooting and hollering to see a muskrat come out. Uh, that excitement is quickly uh, replaced with a little bit of disgust because a partially digested muskrat smells about as good as you oh. think it probably does. <laughs> yeah. So um, that that turned from really happy to, OK, let's get this taken care of and get it off the boat as quick as possible in a hurry. Um, we also saw just some really long stuff. Like I think the longest prey item we saw in a musky stomach was like a 26 inch northern pike, uh, which is just crazy to think about even when you look at some of the biggest gaudiest musky lures that are on the market i mean there's not very much that's coming anywhere close to 26 inches in length so uh there yeah just kind of the sheer size of what they're able to eat is really impressive yeah i mean obviously just thinking like in human terms like how you get something like that down without choking and (laughs) killing yourself and like you see you know we've seen bass before bass floating at the you know surface of the water and they have some big tilapia or crappie or something stuck sideways in its mouth and that bass dies that way it's like how does a muskie not kill itself trying to gorge itself on some of these giant pieces of prey but again hats off to muskie the uh evolutionary (laughs) (laughs) process of muskie has basically said i don't care i'm going to eat it if i can see it Yep, pretty much. (laughs) So what does the DNR do with 
information like this moving forward. Like you've collected all this data, you know what's in these fish's stomachs, you've had the chance to dissect a lot of that. What do you use that for moving forward, whether it be policy, whether it be stocking, whether it be, you know, just for future research? How does this play a role for you? Yeah, so I guess uh, in terms of fisheries management, uh, it probably doesn't change a whole lot in terms of what we're currently doing. Um, the one place where it might have a little bit of an effect is where uh, the state's currently in the process of updating the long range musky management plan for kind of the statewide musky program. And so the information that we collected will be integrated into that, and that might kind of guide recommendations in terms of future stocking efforts. Um, lakes that have, you know, kind of the preferred prey, uh, really good perch populations, really good sucker populations, maybe some Cisco's if you're lucky. Um, those are kind of going to be the lakes that are probably preferred in terms of where we might try to stock muskies going forward. Um, a lot of that information was in the last version of the plan too, so probably not a whole lot of changes there. Uh, probably the bigger component of this though is so I mentioned, you know, kind of the, the sentiment towards muskies and what they do to lakes where they're stocked. Uh, prior to this research being done, there was actually a push in the Minnesota legislature to kind of restrict how the DNR could manage and stock muskies throughout the state. Uh, basically, it just it came down to uh, some legislators that uh, just weren't a fan of, you know, having muskies in lakes in their area and they wanted to see something changed with that. And, you know, it, ultimately that legislation didn't go through and it's been really quiet on that front recently. So I'm not sure how much of that sentiment is still out there. But during that process, when people were going to testify uh, at the Capitol, you know, they we didn't really have any good data from within the state looking specifically at Minnesota lakes to say, you know, this is how muskies affect these lake ecosystems, these food webs, these other fish species. So that's where this information will be really key uh, going forward. And then kind of just opening the door for future research uh, based off some of the findings that we had too. Um, the other big component, uh, something that we didn't really touch on, but was kind of the big take, one of the big takeaways was how much diet overlap the walleye and the pike had. Um, which was maybe not all that surprising to a lot of people that spend a lot of time fishing for walleye and pike in Minnesota. Um, a lot of times if you're fishing for one, you'll end up catching both in a lot of lakes, especially where they both have good populations. Uh, but really just seeing how much those two fish really keyed in on yellow perch for their prey, uh, which is important in terms of managing the predator species because you need to make sure that there's enough perch to handle stocking rates or management or whatever. But also in terms of focusing on, okay, these yellow perch are super important, not just as a potential recreational fish in lakes where they get big, but they are really, really important in terms of food for a lot of the predator fish that people are targeting. So we need to make sure that we're managing these lakes in a way that the perch populations stay healthy and are able to support those predators. So that'll be another big uh, key takeaway from this study. Yeah, that was one thing that was interesting to me as I was reading through you know, a couple of days ago was like the, I would assume anyway, just dumb, you know, angler brain that I've had over the past, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever. Pikes seem like they're the ones that just indiscretionary feeding, like if it's moving, they'll go out and try and kill it. They will try and swipe and eat anything. They're just mean little snot rockets that are going all over the place a million miles an hour. You know, they're listening to death metal as they're, you know, swimming through the water and just anything that moves, I'm going to go see if I can kill that thing. And having your study say basically, you know, like you said, two of the most similar diet patterns were pike and walleye. And I would have assumed those were very different patterns of diet and it's just doesn't seem to be the case, especially, you know, perch. Perch makes a whole lot of sense, obviously, on both of those. Did you see both species consuming the same size of perch? Because my brain also says, well, that could make sense, but maybe pike are feeding on more of the larger mature perch and walleye are focusing on more of the, you know, three, four, five, you know, six inch perch type deal. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, the lakes that we were looking at didn't have a ton of those real big perch, um, okay. you know, like the, the stuff you'd see in like the South Dakota glacial lakes, those big 13, 14 inch jumbo perch or up on green Bay, or even over on Lake Erie. Um, it was a lot of fish, you know, 
kind of stacked up in yeah like that three to six inch size range and that could be another component to this too um just because walleye and pike were feeding heavily on perch doesn't mean that they were competing for perch because in the vast majority of the lakes we looked at there were just millions of yellow perch we'd be driving around with that electrofishing boat and there would just be clouds of perch coming up especially in the spring when they're out shallow spawning it's just really incredible to see just how many yellow perch are really in the system So that could be a function of it too. It may not be that it's so much the yellow perch that are the preferred prey for walleye and pike. It's that they're really abundant. So that's what the walleye and pike are eating. But even if that's the case, it's still important to make sure that those abundant yellow perch populations remain abundant so that they can continue to support the the predator biomass that these lakes have and that people are looking for when they're out fishing. So what do you do as a management team to say, all right, we need to keep perch populations healthy is that more of a managing the you know limits on perch is it managing habitat is it managing whatever perch eat right forage base for them because you know it's not as simple at least for perch as it is for some other things where it's like all right let's go build them some habitat or something perch are obviously a little bit different so is it stocking numbers how do you guys make sure that you maintain healthy perch populations the biggest way that we can probably do that is by uh, manipulating the predator populations. So whether that's through changes in stocking rates, changes in harvest size limits or harvest bag limits, um, something that can help us move the needle just a little bit. It really doesn't need to be a whole lot on those pike and walleye populations. That's actually something that's going on right now in the state. Uh, Not too long ago, they changed Northern pike regulations to kind of have three separate zones throughout the state. And in kind of the biggest zone of the state where there's a lot of lakes with kind of those stunted hammer handled northern pike, the bag limit went up to 10 fish with a 22 to 26 inch protected slot and two over 26. So really just encouraging harvest of those small stunted pike to try to thin them out. And then the other thing, too, uh, we saw it with muskies where they were eating some northern pike, but there's been a lot of research on pike especially over in europe where they get some real big pike and they've shown that big pike are actually really good at controlling pike populations so if you're able to kind of shift the size structure of a pike population so that there's more bigger fish they'll kind of keep those smaller fish in check a little bit more uh, and that can kind of help create a little bit better balance in the ecosystem so that's something we're trying to do Um, we run into issues a little bit if uh, people don't harvest which has been a little bit of an issue with pike specifically but there's been some trends kind of in specific lakes uh for now um where harvest rates are just kind of going down more people are out there catch and release fishing which is great but that just kind of uh makes it a little bit more difficult for us to move the needle in terms of shifting these populations a little bit All right, everybody, we'll get back to our episode here in just a second. But first, the Tackle Talk podcast is brought to you in part by Dakota Lithium Batteries. And over the past few weeks, you've heard me talk about it. I've been loading and unloading my gear and really taking a second to appreciate the abuse that I put my batteries through day in and day out. My batteries are not pretty. They're beat up. They're faded. They're dirty. They've got mud on them. In all honesty, they are probably abused more than batteries should be abused. But despite all of that torture that I put these things through, they still work just like the day they came out of the box. Batteries aren't made to be pretty. They're not made to sit up on a shelf. They are made to work. And every single time I load those batteries into my kayak, they flat out work. Any conditions, any situations when I need power, I've got it with Dakota Lithium. That's because Dakota Lithium batteries are twice the power of traditional batteries at half the weight. They charge up to five times faster. They last up to four times longer. They have a 100% US-based customer support system, and they come with a whopping 11-year warranty and you don't have to pay full price because you listen to tackle talk we're here to save you 10 percent by using code tackle talk 10 use that code on your next battery purchase over at www.dakotalithium.com code tackle talk 10 the official lithium battery of bassmaster 
So that takes us to study number two here that you are part of called Comparing Consumption Patterns of Musky, Northern Pike, Walleye, and Largemouth Bass Populations. So this takes a little different spin, right, of looking at how big the population of a certain species is and are they, you know, performing as you would assume or outperforming or underperforming their percentage of the population in a specific lake in terms of how much forage they're eating. So I think in either one or a couple of the lakes, you had like largemouth bass making up about 50 percent of the population of the total predators then you had northern pike that were like 31 34 percent around there you had walleye that were 17 to 18 percent and then musky at one to four percent and that's the population number so how many of them are in the body of water as a whole did their diets mirror that or did you find that some species outperformed or underperformed their population number Yeah, so this was a little bit interesting, and this kind of goes back to kind of that notion that muskies go in the lake and they're just going to eat everything. And we know that, yes, individual muskies, in order to reach the size that they get, they have to eat a lot of food because they're growing a lot, they get big. Uh, But if you scale that to the population, are muskie populations actually eating all the food in the lake, or are they eating relatively less food in the lake because their population density is so low and that's exactly what we found Um, even though individual muskies eat substantially more food than any of these other predators their populations were eating far less food in these lakes uh, than the other populations just because kind of you gave that rundown um, their population size was just so much lower Um, it didn't follow the percentages exactly and it kind of varied lake to lake But the general pattern was pretty consistent where actually northern pike ended up eating the most food in every lake. And then next was largemouth bass. And that's that shift between bass being the most abundant and then pike eating the most food is just because pike grow a little bit bigger. Uh, They tend to have a little bit faster growth. Um, So they they're eating more food um, as a whole, as a population compared to the bass. Uh, But then the walleye and the muskies were down quite a bit lower than those other two populations. Uh, Walleye tended to eat a little bit more than the muskies, but it was generally pretty close. Did you see any sort of like indication that things like, you know, bass and northern pike and walleye, um, musky, things like that, that they were a detriment to each other, like being in the same ecosystem. So you've got those four predators in the same lake, you know, feeding on the same food. Was there ever any point in your, you know, process where you're like, okay, maybe this specific iteration or this specific, you know, uh, makeup of the predator is not ideal and maybe it would be better if there was X percent more of one species versus the other. I hope that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I think that kind of makes sense. And actually, that was one of the surprising things we found in this study was just how consistent those percentages that each species made up of the total population were across the three lakes. We did this study on three different lakes and just vastly different lakes. One of the lakes was in the Twin Cities metro area, uh, you know, kind of not quite south part of Minnesota, but a ways farther south generally warmer than the northern part of the state. Uh, We had one lake, kind of central Minnesota, deeper, clearer, um, and then another lake way up north with Cisco's really deep water. I think it got to like 90 feet deep, quite a bit cooler. And, you know, kind of across the board, those percentages held pretty true. So it seemed like once those four species were in the lake, uh, they tended to have kind of a, a good balance point that they reached um, through time. So that was one of the the more surprising things we saw was just how consistent that pattern was. Yeah. It'd be really interesting. Like you said, if you broaden that out and look at different States and, you know, farther away, it's like, I would assume in most of our lakes around here, it's pretty similar to that. Aside from, we don't have a lot of lakes that have a lot of pike in them, but if you just look at the, you know, large mouth, small mouth, whatever kind of bass you've got in that lake, you've got walleye and you've got muskie. I would say those are probably pretty spot on. Take the Northern pike out of the equation. I would bet predatory fish and, you know, you're taking out panfish and stuff in this too. I would say it's probably, I don't know, two to one bass to, to walleye, which is kind of what you're seeing in your breakdowns. And then musky are just this outlier where yes, they might be all over the lake, but there's one, like, that's the other thing too, side tangent here. But now that we have like live sonar and stuff, you can see musky, you know, there's one, maybe every, I don't know, 50 yards or so as you're going around, you're looking around, you're seeing, but there's not a pack of, you know, 
20 of them swimming around like there are bass or like there are walleye or things like that. So they're spread out evenly amongst the lake, but they're just such kind of lone wolves a lot of time, too, that, uh, yeah, there's not as many as you think there are in the lake, I'm sure. Right. So that's very cool. And then your third study here, I'm going to butcher this, interannual and interseasonal differences in the diets of largemouth bass, musky, northern pike, and walleye in Bald Eagle Lake, Minnesota. So in this study, not only did you look at the breakdown of diet among your four predatory species, but you looked at the differences in that diet between seasons, between years, things like that. So this was a really cool study too. Again, just as an angler, putting on my angler hat and saying, how can I get a leg up out there? Well, one of those would be to figure out what differences there are between, you know, bass specifically. You mentioned a couple things in here that I want to ask on because we have a lot of bass anglers that listen to this. And there were a couple sentences that stuck out. And I was like, that's not something that, you know, I necessarily thought of, but it makes a whole lot of sense. So to back up a little bit, before we start this I'm not too proud to admit that I don't know what some vocab words mean, and there's some uh, terminology in some of these studies that I wasn't quite familiar with. What is permanova? Yeah, so that's just kind of the statistical test that we use to compare, you know, between seasons or between years. Uh, Basically, what we can do is instead of saying, you know, you've got X and Y, we're going to compare it when you're looking at diet at diet data, you have, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, however many different prey groups that you have. And so instead of going individually one by one, compare X to Y, X to Z, um, you can kind of smash that all together and compare kind of how how it looks as a whole uh, with those individual percentages for different prey groups. So just the, the statistical tests that we were using. What about pairwise test? That was another one that I heard and saw for the first time. And I was like, God, I mean, I can use context clues and sort of figure it out. But is that something specific to these type of studies? Uh, Not so much to these types of studies. So basically a pairwise test um, with the the Permanova, basically you plug everything in and say you're interested in our muskies eating different things in different seasons. So you plug in the musky diets with season as your variable of interest and it'll spit out a value um, that's kind of the statistical value. And if it meets the threshold where you say, okay, this is biologically meaningful, we're interested in what this means, then you can take a pairwise test, which different statistics have different pairwise tests. But then it takes that and says, okay, muskies are eating different things in different seasons. Now let's compare spring to summer, spring to fall, summer to fall, and see where those true differences actually are. So here's the question that every angler listening to this wants to know. You have four different types of species here. Obviously, you got largemouth, you got pike, you got walleye, you got musky. We've been told our whole life that like, yes, fish feed heavy in the fall. They feed heavy in the spring, you know, winter, summer, a little different sometimes. Did you observe any hard data uh, seasonal changes that anglers can take away from and say, you know what, this was something we noticed. This happens for one of these species in the fall that doesn't happen in the spring. Or did you did you actually see differences or is it something where they're eating pretty much the same stuff all year long? Yeah, so for three of the four stu- or species, there really wasn't much of an effect on season. It seemed like they were eating mostly the same stuff all year long. Uh, bass were the one outlier. They they did tend to have a little bit different diet throughout the course of the year. Uh, the one thing I will note here, though, uh, just to, to not rain on your parade too much, just because they're eating the same things, these tests don't necessarily look at how much the fish are eating. So the the percentage of empty stomachs that we encountered while we were doing this research, we didn't actually look at that in this study. So it's hard to say for sure if fish were maybe eating more in the spring or more in the fall, that kind of thing. But in terms of the actual makeup of the diet, those fish that were eating things, uh, it tended to be pretty consistent across the year. So you said bass were the one that was different. What's the difference in bass that you were noticing from season to season? Yeah, so bass tended to eat more bugs, invertebrates, crayfish in the springtime. And then as it got later in the year, they would shift uh, more towards fish, particularly sunfish uh, with a little bit of crappie mixed in too. So yeah, not quite sure what to make of that. Uh, It could be kind of an abundance thing. Those sunfish that hatch, you know, June, July in Minnesota lakes, uh, they might be reaching a size that is 
is edible to a bass by the time it gets to fall. Uh, it could be just water temperature at the time we were sampling where maybe bugs were hatching while we were there. And that was an available prey resource for, for those bass. Um, but still interesting nonetheless. My redneck explanation for this as I was reading through this and thinking through was it made a lot of sense to me as you sit there and you think, why why would bass eat more invertebrates in the springtime? And then I thought, and I literally, like, you look outside, it's pouring rain. And what happens, you know, we're in, I'm in Dayton, Ohio. We're in a giant bowl. There's three rivers that converge into Dayton, Ohio. And what happens is there's so much runoff. There's so much water getting put into those systems. And then those systems feed into our lakes around here. What's getting washed into the water is bugs and invertebrates and worms and everything that's, you know, getting pushed into the water that's normally on land. It's not pushing more bluegill or something into the water, right? Those things are always there. So it made a lot of sense to me thinking, all right, naturally what's happening in the spring There's runoff. There's water being pushed into other pieces of water and it's carrying along other things with it. And that, at least to me, made a whole lot of sense where it's like, all right, yeah, maybe I should go out in the spring and throw more, you know, Helgramite profiles, more, you know, bug and worm and cicada and that kind of stuff, right, of bugs and invertebrates versus focusing on, you know, big swim baits or, you know, things like that. It it did at least make sense to me. And I think there's probably a little something to that, depending on where you're fishing, what type of water you're fishing. But um, does that make sense to you at all? Yeah. And one other thing I'll add to, um, so springtime, you know, is pretty vague. We were generally starting this process, you know, within a week of the ice going out on a lot of these lakes. So, you know, really early spring in a lot of cases. And so that's before any of the fish that might be prey species for these predators have had a chance to spawn. So the average size of those prey fish is as big as it's going to be throughout the course of a year, because all the small stuff has been eaten over the last or the course of the last year. Uh, they haven't spawned again. There's no real little bluegills or little perch or anything that are swimming around. And then as you get later into the season, those fish that spawn a little bit after we started our diet collections, those, you know, age zero fish are growing up. They're, you know, maybe not getting to preferred size, but definitely size that is is of interest to a predator. Even more important than that, though, I think is those those age one fish that survived the first winter. We didn't see them right away in the spring, but they keep growing and then they get to kind of that preferred size, which tends to be, you know, like 20 to 30 percent of whatever the predator's length is uh, based on some of the stuff that we've seen. Um, So that might be kind of part of what's playing into that shift for the bass as well. All right, everybody, we'll get back to our episode here in just a second. But first, the Tackle Talk podcast is brought to you in part by Arctic Coolers. And this past week, it has been in the high 70s, in the mid to high 80s some days here in Ohio at the very beginning of May, which means we are in full warm swing mode and summer is going to be here before you know it. And summer is officially cooler time, boys and girls. So when you're out on the boat, when you're on the kayak, when you're beating the bank, when you're waiting, Arctic has the gear that you need to make spring and summer enjoyable, safe, and refreshing. If you need an ultra-tough, hard cooler, but you don't want to pay $10,000 for one of those name brands, Arctic has you covered. If you need a soft cooler for the kayak to pack your lunch or your drinks in or your snacks in, Arctic has you covered. Maybe you just need a new coffee mug for your morning commutes or a travel tumbler to keep your hot drinks hot and your cold drinks cold all spring long. Arctic has you covered. So head over to www.rticoutdoors.com. Check out their brand new 22 quart ultralight coolers they just came out with. They have a brand new sage green collection just in time for spring. Again, that's www.rticoutdoors.com. Keep the adventure going with Arctic. And then you also took a look at over different years, and this is one of the things that surprised me most about this study was it's kind of the opposite of the way it was with seasons, where you found that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think three of the four, so walleye, pike, and largemouth changed significantly year to year in terms of what you were finding that they were eating, where, you know, musky are just kind of like musky eat musky things and and musky kind of (laughs) do their own deal there. But those three, I would not have bet in a million years that the type of you know forage that they're feeding on is changing significantly year after year seasons make a whole lot of sense to me because there is this cycle that happens every year and that would just you know make sense and that's what's happened for all of eternity but what did you notice in terms of differences year by year i think that's so interesting 
Yeah. So one thing I do want to clarify is, so we weren't doing this study in consecutive years. So the first year of this study was 2019, and then 2023 was the second year that we were comparing. So there was a little bit of time in between. But yeah, still to your point, you wouldn't really expect kind of this drastic shift. Um, and that's the other thing I'll say too, in, in these studies, significant probably has a little bit different than um of a meaning than in general conversation. That's kind of a statistical term that we use to indicate, you know, something that's biologically meaningful or that we think might be biologically meaningful. Uh, but kind of the pattern that we saw was that yellow perch actually were way more abundant in the diets that second year of the study than they were the first year. Um, perch populations tend to be a little bit cyclic, so they'll have kind of booms and busts in different years. So based on what we saw, it seems like, you know, maybe that perch population was in a little bit of a lull the first year that we were doing the diets, more sunfish, more crappies, more other kind of crayfish in the diets that year compared to the second year when, you know, we saw kind of an influx of yellow perch in the diets. One thing that could be playing into the muskies being the outlier, I think generally we did see a little bit of a shift towards yellow perch in the second year. Muskies are just such low density and so hard to get your hands on that our sample size probably wasn't quite there to say, you know, this is this is really meaningful change over the course of these years. But there was a little bit of a shift that you could kind of see if you looked at kind of the general patterns. So obviously perch makes sense, right? Because like you said, perch are cyclical. Um, you can have good years in perch, bad years in perch here in Ohio. We hear about that on like Lake Erie all the time. It's like, oh, it's never been better. And then five years from now, people will be complaining that it's the worst perch they've had up there in 50 years. But are there other species like that in these bodies of water that could play a role similar to what perch are? So it seems like bluegill are scary, consistent all the time. Like you're not going to have good and bad bluegill years for the most part you've got gills you've got gills they kind of do their own thing spawn multiple times a year they're very hardy they they make their way through but like crappie um anything else like that do you guys see anything maybe if i have a lake that doesn't have a big perch population are there other forage that could mimic that yeah i think crappie is another one that we tend to see pretty cyclic populations into uh the other thing is just you know kind of the the variability in the spring weather can really dictate whether or not there's a good year class of fish coming up, especially for those those early spawners. So that's, you know, suckers are a big one that spawn early. Walleye, pike, muskies all tend to spawn pretty early in the year. Perch are in that group as well that they spawn early in the year. And especially, like I don't know about you guys down in Ohio, but this year we had near record ice off on a lot of lakes in the state. And then we were just slammed with a series of cold fronts for the past month and a half or so to the point that we, you know, things are basically on track to maybe even a little bit behind what they normally are in a spring, even with near record early ice outs this year. And so that spring variability in water temperature and just, you know, those, those cold fronts, especially in an early spring can really do uh, do a number on those early spawning fish. They kind of need a nice gradual ramp up in water temperature for those eggs and those fry to survive and do well. So when you have years like this where, you know, they don't get that, that nice warming pattern, uh, that can be problematic for them and cause, you know, boom and bust cycles as well. Well, to start to put a bow on this a little bit, these three studies and a lot of the other studies that, you know, you've done that are along the same lines of the diet of predatory fish. Do you feel like you and your team accomplished what your goal was starting out? Or I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, do you even have a goal when you're starting out of like, hey, here's what we want to do to say that this was a success? Or is it just more intellectual curiosity and find out what you can find out? Well, I guess selfishly, I'll say my goal when I started out was to get my master's degree and get a job. So in that vein, I would say, yes, I did accomplish yeah. that goal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in terms of, you know, kind of the management agency goals, I, I think, yes, we kind of got uh, the data that we wanted. Um, we're still kind of actually playing around with this data, too, a little bit. So there's maybe some more stories that we'll be able to tell uh, with some of this data as well. But uh, in terms of, you know, just getting a good detailed look at what these predator fish are eating in a, a wide variety of lakes throughout the state, um, I would say, yeah, we, we did a pretty good job at that. 
So what's next on the horizon for you guys? Do you have any projects you're currently working on or ones in the planning stages that kind of build off of these? Yeah, so nothing in terms of new projects that are on the horizon. Um, it's basically we've got, you know, four plus years of really good diet data um, that we've really just kind of started scratching the surface on in terms of um, statistical analyses and then writing, you know, in terms of peer reviewed papers and that kind of thing. So still working on some of that stuff. I've got a couple different papers that I'm working on right now. And I actually just got another email today from one of my co-authors about another paper idea that we're hopefully going to talk about next week. Um, the one downside is that with my current job, I don't have quite as much time to dedicate towards some of this research as I used to while I was in grad school. And this was my primary focus. So in my, my current role, you know, my the stuff I'm working on now kind of varies by seasons. And we're in the midst of our spring stocking season right now. Uh, we've done several trout stockings in area lakes. We have a walleye hatchery that we run out of our area office. Um, that wrapped up a couple weeks ago, and we should be stocking fry next week. And then that'll lead right into our summer uh, survey season. So we'll go out and do test netting on a wide variety of lakes throughout our area. Uh, and then wrap things up for our field season in the fall uh, with a combination of more trout stocking, walleye fingerling stocking, and then musky stocking as well. And then winter time is spent, you know, trying to write up the the reports from those those net surveys that we do over the summer. And then when I have, you know, a day or two here to kind of play around with some of this data and try to get some writing done, uh, that's that's my next objective. Well, the last question here I have for you is actually from a listener. So we have the mailbag question here powered by Dakota Lithium. You can use code TackleTalk10 for 10% off, dakotalithium.com. This question is from Keith. And this was a question that Keith wrote into our mailbag here at the show. And sometimes there's just you know, uh, questions that probably aren't best fitted for me and are best fitted for someone else. So this one fits up actually pretty perfectly. This is from a while ago. He says, hi, Andrew. After listening to multiple episodes of Tackle Talk with fisheries biologists and researchers, I'm curious if you could recommend where I and others can find scholarly fishing articles to consume. So obviously nobody better to ask, you know, than someone who not only probably peruses them, but writes quite a few of them too. Where would you direct folks? Because it is tough. A lot of this stuff is kind of behind um, the curtain a little bit where it's like, you have to be a researcher to access some of this stuff. And, you know, some of these are so daunting to sift through, to try and find the topics that you're looking for. Where would you recommend is just like regular anglers that want to consume work like you're doing, where would you shoot them toward? So there's kind of two places that I check very regularly and that are open to anybody else to look at too. One of them is just Google Scholar. So, you know, you have kind of just your general Google search bar. Um, if you type into that Google Scholar, it'll take you to something that looks very similar, but it is very much targeted towards kind of these scientific papers. Um, and you can just type whatever you're interested in in that search bar and any kind of scientific research that's relevant to that will come up. Um, a lot of them have links to PDFs of the papers or to at least the website of the journal where they're published, um, where you can get more information on the paper. The other one is ResearchGate, which is kind of, it's almost like a social media platform for scientists, for lack of a better analogy. Um, we're able to go on there, we create our own profiles, and we're able to post updates on our research through that platform. Um, a lot of people do some of the same things on LinkedIn, but it's not quite as consistent. And you kind of have to know who you're looking for on LinkedIn, whereas on ResearchGate, it works a lot like Google Scholar. You can just type in a search up on the top, either for a person, if you know somebody that's working on stuff, or for kind of general topics, and it'll uh, spit out ideas. The other thing I'll say here too, a lot of times, um, yeah, you're 100% right. A lot of this research does end up behind the curtain a little bit. Um, if you're able to find a paper that you're interested in, regardless of if you can read the whole paper or not for free, you should be able to find an email address for one of the people that helped write it. Send them an email and ask them for a copy of the paper. It will 100% make their day and very few people will tell you, no, I can't send you the copy. Um, we are generally or genuinely interested in a lot of the work that we're doing. And when other people are interested in the stuff that we're doing as well, I mean, it, 
if I see an email come through from somebody that's interested in the stuff that I'm doing, I, I get a smile on my face immediately. So um, definitely do that, uh, especially these fisheries biologists. A lot of us are anglers as well as biologists. So we have kind of that angling brain. Um, yeah, just reach out to them, shoot them an email, see if, you know, say, hey, I, I saw this paper online. I'm interested in reading the whole thing. Would you be able to send me a copy? And I would say nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be yes. So definitely use that and uh, reach out to the scientists that are working on this stuff. Well, hey, we appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for coming on here today and talking a little bit about the research that you're doing. If anybody wants to keep up, again, ResearchGate's the one that I use, too. That's where I found your papers, too. So anybody can go on there, look up topics that you're interested in. Um, Like I said, seek out the actual full PDF copies of the papers if you're interested in them. A lot of times you can see the abstract. You can see a quick summary of what your study was about. But there's so much more information if you actually get the full text and you have the time to dive in and look. And it could be even be just one or two sentences in that study that, you know, clicks with you and says, oh, bass eat more invertebrates in the spring. Boom, let's take that, right? So there's all these little nuggets in these studies that you can take away as anglers, and we appreciate your time today, Camden. Thank you so much. It's Camden Glade, fishery specialist, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Camden, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a great talk. All right, everybody, that is today's episode. If you want to contact Camden, I will put his email address in the show notes so you can swipe up or you can go to the information about today's episode, depending on what platform you're listening on is how it's going to look. But either way, I will put his email address in the show notes so that you can reach out if you would like to request the full research papers to review, as he said in the episode. So we really appreciate Camden coming on and explaining some of their findings to us in detail and putting it in simpler terms and language that we as regular regular anglers, regular people can understand and process. So thank you, Camden. We appreciate it. And as always, we appreciate every single one of you listening. Quick reminder, the Give Them the Bean shirts are available right now on the website, www.tackletalkpodcast.com. Click store or click the banner on the homepage to order yours. Find us on Instagram and Facebook at Tackle Talk Podcast. Leave us a review on Apple or Spotify if you can, and we will see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.